Imagine a family so incredibly wealthy that one out of every $20 in circulation once belonged to them. That family was the Vanderbilts, a name synonymous with unimaginable riches. They didn't just swim in wealth, they practically created their own ocean of opulence. But here's the problem. Despite their monumental fortune, they lost it all. So how does the richest family go from having more money than the US Treasury lost their entire fortune? First, let us travel back to the early 1800s to where it all began. It all began with a young boy named Cornelius Vanderbilt, whose journey would defy expectations and rewrite the pages of history. Born into a world devoid of wealth and privilege, his Dutch ancestors arrived in America as humble servants. At just 11 years old, Cornelius dropped out of school to work for his father, a poor farmer and boatman, transporting goods across the waters of New York Harbor. But Cornelius's spirit was restless, his ambition unyielding. After just five years of learning the trade, he yearned to forge his own path. In 1810, he approached his mother with a bold request, a loan of $100, an impressive sum in those days, equivalent to around $2,500 today. Despite her limited means, his mother agreed, but with a condition. To secure the loan, Cornelius had to plow a very rocky field. Undeterred, he embraced the opportunity, understanding its potential. With $100 in his hands, he purchased his very own small sailboat, a vessel that would become the catalyst for his monumental fortune. In the bustling waters of New York Harbor, young Cornelius Vanderbilt launched a ferry and freight service that would connect Staten Island's farms with the emerging hub of Manhattan. But the competition was fierce, so Vanderbilt came up with a ruthless plan. He offered the cheapest fares around, sometimes as low as 18 cents per trip, undercutting everyone else, a method he would employ for most of his career. It didn't take long for him to make enough money to repay his mother's initial investment, plus an extra $1,000 interest. His clever tactics eventually allowed him to buy out his rivals and expand his fleet of ships, earning him the nickname the Commodore. But the Commodore's ambitions didn't stop at the sea. He ventured into steamships and then railroads, ultimately building the largest rail company in the country. His rail lines spanned vast distances connecting cities and towns and transforming the very geography of the United States, making him the richest person in America. At the time of his death in 1877, the Commodore's fortune was valued at $100 million, equal to nearly $2.8 billion today. More money than was held in the US Treasury at the time. Despite the Commodore's vast fortune and 13 children, his will entrusted a staggering 95% of his wealth to his eldest son, William Henry Billy Vanderbilt. In his eyes, the others lacked the strength and acumen needed to safeguard and grow the family's riches. And indeed, he was right. In just eight years after the Commodore's passing, Billy managed to double the fortune, amassing an astronomical sum of nearly $200 million. It stood as the largest wealth accumulation in the entire world at that time. So then, why is it that by 1973, when the Vanderbilts held their first family reunion at their namesake university, not a single one out of 120 attendees was a millionaire? After the passing of Billy Vanderbilt in 1885, his vast fortune was divided among his children. Cornelius Vanderbilt II received $80 million. William Kissam Vanderbilt inherited $60 million, while the two younger brothers each received $10 million. They indulged in their newfound wealth. William Kissam, the Commodore's grandson, with his $60 million inheritance, embarked on the grand construction of Marble House, a lavish mansion perched on Newport's cliffs. The cost was an astounding $11 million, featuring over 500,000 cubic feet of marble. Marble House stood as a lavish birthday gift for his wife, Alva Vanderbilt. Yet, this was merely a summer retreat, as the couple possessed numerous other residences. In the dazzling Gilded Age of New York, a period where the Vanderbilts held prominence, a strict social hierarchy governed the elite circles. As fortunes multiplied in the wake of the Civil War and Industrial Revolution, the upper class found themselves faced with a pressing question. Who would be granted entry into their coveted circles? Mrs. Caroline Astor and her trusted confidant, Ward McAllister, assumed the role of gatekeepers. Together, they curated the influential list of 400, 
a revered catalog that determined the privileged few worthy of entering the esteemed realm of New York's high society. The Vanderbilts, who were newly rich, were not included in this list. Undeterred by the initial exclusion, Alva Vanderbilt, William Kissam's wife, a determined social climber, set her sights on winning the approval of the elites. She resolved to spend millions from her husband's inheritance to build the grandest mansion in New York, known as the Petit Chateau. Completed in 1883 after three years of construction, the total cost reached $3 million, equivalent to approximately $89 million today. Alva spared no expense and hosted an extravagant ball that reportedly cost $250,000, or $7.4 million today. The gamble paid off as Caroline Astor extended her welcome, embracing Alva into the elite rank. In retrospect, Alva had squandered a staggering $96.4 million to be accepted into the cool crowd. However, this acceptance did not immediately extend to the rest of the Vanderbilt family, so they embarked on their own mansion-building spree. From this point forward, it was a downward spiral of various family members competing to build the largest and fanciest homes that were hardly ever occupied. Determined not to be outshined by his sister-in-law, Alva, Cornelius Vanderbilt II built a remarkable mansion in Newport known as the Breakers. This awe-inspiring residence perched on a cliff spanned an acre and boasted 70 rooms across five floors, showcasing elegant Italian Renaissance style. The grandeur of the mansion was further enhanced by a carriage house, stables, and a team of dedicated stable boys. Although the Vanderbilts only visited for a few weeks each year during Newport's vibrant social season, the house remained active year-round with a full staff. Cornelius II, the Commodore's favorite grandson, also took on the ambitious project of constructing the largest private residence ever seen in Manhattan. The Cornelius Vanderbilt II house, spanning six floors and housing 130 rooms, featured a small and large salon, a magnificent two-story ballroom, and a gallery. The colossal estate required the dedicated service of 37 household staff, along with additional assistance for the Vanderbilts and their seven children. Sadly, after Cornelius II's passing in 1899, his widow, Alice Vanderbilt, was left with a trust fund of $250,000 to sustain and manage both residences. However, this amount proved insufficient, and the expenses associated with maintaining the two houses quickly drained the Vanderbilt fortune. In 1926, Alice was forced to sell the Fifth Avenue home, which was ultimately demolished. Tragically, the majority of these magnificent residences met a similar fate in the late 1920s as they were sold to real estate developers and demolished. Inspired by the extravagant mansions of his relatives, George W. Vanderbilt, the youngest son of Billy Vanderbilt, ventured to Asheville, North Carolina to create Biltmore. Completed in 1895, this vast 30,000-acre estate boasts a magnificent 250-room French Renaissance castle. The construction of Biltmore spanned six years and cost nearly $6 million, equivalent to around $217 million today. Biltmore House, now a cherished tourist attraction and national landmark, stands as the largest privately owned home in the country and remains under the care of Vanderbilt descendants. In contrast to their predecessors, the Commodore and Billy Vanderbilt, the third and fourth generations lived lavish lives and recklessly squandered their fortunes. They invested millions upon millions in sprawling country estates, only to rarely set foot in them. These grand properties, intended as summer retreats, were occupied for just a few weeks each year. In addition to their lavish lifestyles, they also dedicated considerable funds to philanthropy and pursuing their personal passions. They made significant contributions including endowing Vanderbilt University and supporting various charitable causes such as the YMCA, arts, sciences, and medicine. As the Vanderbilts lived their lives, enjoying the immense wealth amassed by the Commodore and his eldest son, they paid little attention to the origins of their fortune. However, the turn of the century brought significant changes, including the introduction of estate, gift, and income taxes by the U.S. government. These new taxes, combined with the impact of the Great Depression, dealt a heavy blow to the Vanderbilt's finances and extravagant lifestyles. To cope with the financial strain, the Vanderbilt's were forced to seek alternative means of sustaining their lavish estates. 
In 1930, they made the decision to open Biltmore to the public, hoping to boost tourism and generate income to preserve the estate. While other affluent families weathered the storm, the Vanderbilt's excessive spending and lack of focus on growing their wealth left them particularly vulnerable to the effects of taxes and economic downturn. As the family fortune was divided among numerous descendants who indulged in extravagant spending, the original source of their wealth, New York Central, began to decline in value, and advancements in transportation further impacted their business. Additionally, the Vanderbilts violated a fundamental rule of wealth preservation by depleting the capital itself instead of relying on investment returns. The consequences were evident in the lives of Cornelius II's sons, Neely and Reginald Claypool Vanderbilt, who were the first to squander their entire inheritances. Reginald's life took a tragic turn as he succumbed to liver cirrhosis at the young age of 45 in 1925. His reckless behavior, particularly his gambling habits, had drained most of his inheritance, leaving him penniless and deeply in debt. Reginald left behind a widow and a baby daughter who had to rely on the interest payments from the young girl's $5 million trust fund until she turned 21. That young girl was none other than Gloria Vanderbilt, who would go on to achieve fame as a fashion designer, writer, artist, actress, and socialite. She notably made headlines in the early 1980s with her successful line of jeans. Despite her public success, Gloria made it clear to her son, Anderson Cooper, a prominent news anchor, that there was no substantial trust fund left for him. By the late 20th century, barely a century after the Commodore had ascended to become the richest man in America, with his son following as the richest man in the world, the Vanderbilt family fortune had diminished to insignificance. When Gloria Vanderbilt passed away in 2019, Cooper inherited most of her estate. However, despite public estimations valuing it at $200 million, the actual value amounted to only around $1.5 million. A stark reminder of the dwindling Vanderbilt legacy. From rags to unimaginable riches, the Vanderbilt story serves as a powerful reminder of the fragile nature of wealth and the devastating consequences of unchecked excess. In just four generations, they managed to erase what the Commodore had built in a single lifetime. So let the story of the Vanderbilts serve as a resounding reminder for us all. To treasure the gifts we possess, make wise investments, and find fulfillment in the intangible riches. For in the end, it is not the size of our bank account, but the lessons we learn and the lives we touch that truly define our legacy. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button and follow us for more amazing content. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.